This is Book 2, Chapter 4, Part 1. Maze laid some wrinkled bills for rent in the lobby while the Pakistani who worked the desk was spilling diatribe like a mattress cut open on the side of the road, sharing his dislike for us freely. Why would you yell at someone while they're in the middle of paying you? Pakistan must have been an unusual sort of culture. I walked over to make friends with the vending machine. The chips and candies were pinned by the coils getting squeezed. I wanted to free them, I really did. Behind me, the man kept repeating himself like a fool. Ten dollars, ten dollars for her, and no more after hours, see? This is not allowed. He was trying to point to a sign printed up with rules on the wall, but the wall was in front of the window, and he didn't feel like coming out of the office. The turtle prefers not to come out of its shell. So he was stretching his arm and neck out of the office window. Mays had never read the sign and never would. I tried not to watch our reality television show through the vending machine glass. The gum and lifesavers were always at the very bottom. Why? If I made these machines, I would have put the gum and lifesavers at the very top. Because who doesn't need gum and who the hell doesn't want a lifesaver? Problem was, they were less expensive. And everything always came down to money with humans. Ten dollars, ten dollars, bouncing off the walls. Just give him the cash to shut him the hell up. The beech nut lifesavers have been sitting there half hidden in the pit for years, saving lives circa 1912. I remember when they were butter rum, and after prohibition, they were butter yum. America, there's got to be a good reason they're still here. It can't be the preservatives. I got tired of watching my boyfriend on TV and focused intently on the coils. I got the Cracker Jack coil to spin and drop a Cracker Jack into the pit. Then dropped some famous Amos cookies. That was his favorite. And I dropped some lifesavers too and walked back to push the hair back from Maze's face so I could see him. He was hardly disturbed and was fishing change out of his pockets. I started to pull the change out of my pockets, too. We would deluge them with pennies, we would. Save it, would you, Mays finally said, pushing change toward the packy. Here, take our goddamn money. The guy kept on about me in his head how I was such a terrible problem and broke all the rules simply because I slipped in after hours to be with the one I loved. How very awful to fall in love. Contrary to the system they set up like a house of cards, wow, you would think we were the devil incarnate, leading by our hearts and everything. I swear, next time he blew a gasket, I would find a special, natural consequence to administer. Stealing his voice would be a start. In the office behind him, a woman in a sari was seated on the couch. I felt sort of bad for her. I never could tell if she was his wife or his sister, but they were clearly related. She was demure, but I was sure she was acting. She kept busy with office work most of the time, but for now she was just sitting on the couch, watching us all like I was, like TV. I secretly favored her, and she favored me. She was laughing to herself about the pennies, anyway. Sometimes we were lucky, and the men were out, and she came to the window for the rent, and never said anything crass or objectionable to us. She was all kindness.